Hello, my name is Richard Grannon and uh, I currently work as, um, I'd say, a life coach who helps people to overcome childhood trauma and the trauma of uh, emotional abuse in narcissistically abusive relationships. Formerly, I was a self-protection instructor. Um, this is a video about being bullied and this is a video about being coerced into doing things that you don't want to do. I myself, as an adult, don't like being pressured into doing things, ever. So when we say bullying, this covers a, a very, very broad spectrum of behavior. So often we would think about school, um, we may think about within a household, or you can take it to criminality, like full scale. Somebody pulls out a gun and says, give me your money or else I'm going to shoot you. Under these circumstances, in order for this behavior, bullying or pressuring a person, the person doing the bullying has an end goal. They have uh, an agenda. They may state it, or they may imply it, or they might just say, just do as you're told, and we'll tell you why later on. So they have an agenda, and they apply bullying, which is pressure. At school, this is kids calling each other names, maybe a little bit of physical violence. Within a household, this could be verbal, it could be physical. And when it's criminal, it's right the way up to somebody holding a gun to you and saying, do as you're told or else. So in order for bullying to work and for pressure to be applied to a person to fulfill an agenda, what you can see with all of these circumstances, there's one key element, which is threat. Threat. Now, once we've established that threat is a key element that needs to be used as leverage, the implied message of the threat is do what I'm telling you to do with my pressure, fulfill my agenda, or else, dot, 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 or else. So why do we go along with bullies under any of these circumstances? Well, because of the threat of the or else. So if there's no or else, we won't do it. It's like if a bully tries to bully you, but they're half your size in school, you just go, no, stop, stop that. If somebody tries to rob you and they forget to show up with a knife or a gun, then you just say, no, I'm not. Give us your money. I would prefer not to. Have a good day. Goodbye. Similarly, in a household, if there's no leverage, if there's no power dynamic, they can't do it. So I'm also going to assert that the greater the threat, so the more of a threat there is, the more pressure there is, the more people will be motivated to take action. In alignment with whatever the agenda is because of the threat of the or else. So the more of this you have, the more of this you have. So if we we're plotting that as a graph, it would go like that. So it would be proportionate. The more threat there is, the more obedience you have. Now, as the bully, one of your agendas, of course, would be to get obedience. But one of the things that you have to do to get obedience from an adult is in order to get your agenda in, is you have to use shock tactics. And these shock tactics ideally should, pro um, should provoke an intense emotional response. So I'm going to describe something disturbing to you, but I'm going to do it in dry language. If you're uh, easily hashtag triggered, by descriptions of real world violence, you should turn this um, video off now. When uh, 
it is studied. There are people out there whose job, unfortunately, is to study criminal behavior. And they study what criminals do. And they say, okay, across a broad series of cases and across a broad, a broad series of uh, scenarios with different agendas, who would apply pressure and threat to get uh, obedience and to force people to take action. Well, if somebody breaks into your house and they're armed and they threaten your family, you will do as they say or else. If they're terrorists and they've broken into the hotel or the airplane to fulfill a different agenda, you're gonna do as they say or else. If they're robbing the place, so on and so forth. What do the statistics indicate as far as different options of response because you as an individual, as an adult, you can either go with what they want you to do, to do, you can go with it, or you can say no. Here's an interesting thing. You know the scene in the movie, we've all seen these movies, where the gangsters come or the criminals come and they pull out a gun. And, they, and it's a busy New York street. And they say, get in the car. Get in the car now. I remember as a kid watching that and being like, why would you get in the car? Why would you do that? It's a gun. So what's the threat? You're going to shoot me. Okay, well, shoot me then. Because whatever's going to happen when I get in the car is surely going to be worse than being shot on a busy sidewalk in front of a bunch of witnesses. I remember thinking that as a kid. Years later... Uh, when I was working in the self-protection industry, I had the opportunity to speak to guys who did behavioral analysis when it came to crime. And I asked them, what do the statistics indicate? If you just do what the criminal wants, what happens? And they told me a few things. They said, first of all, never go to a secondary crime scene. Never. Only bad things. Well, not only. Typically, the worst things will happen to you at a secondary crime scene. The criminal wants to take you from where you are to another place to do really bad stuff to you, really bad things. So don't go. So if that happens and somebody goes, get in the car now and they threaten you, you're actually better off fighting and dying right there on the sidewalk. That's a brutal decision to make. But if you read and find out of these poor you know, you have like behavioral units like in the FBI and they have to go through what actually happens at secondary crime, uh, uh, secondary crime locations. It's not nice. If they're trying to rob you, they come into the bank and they say, do as we, do as we say. And they get a chance to tie people up and move them to another room. Or if they get into the house and they get a chance and they can tie people up and they can get them to obey, you only have to look at the behavior of uh, serial killers to know what happens next. When that gun is in your face, when the threat is there, every instinct inside of you is going to be saying, obey. Give them the obedience they want because the threat is high, you're in shock, you've got a strong emotional response, and you'll be thinking, I'll just do it. I'll just do it. <clears throat> Probably it's an infantilizing and terrifying experience that makes us hopeful because in all of our normal lives, up until that point as adults, we're transactional with other adults and we behave generally within a spectrum of being fair. Generally within a spectrum of being fair. But the statistics, sadly, don't indicate that anything good comes from obedience when you are dealing with bullies, terrorists and criminals and abusive narcissistic psychopaths. If they want to take you to a secondary location, you're probably gonna die there and it's probably gonna be a very, very unpleasant death. If they're asking you to put restraints on, there's a chance that they may rob you and leave, but also statistics indicate that it's pretty bad. You don't want to be restrained. If you get the chance to fight, you should fight. If you get the chance to leave, you should leave. That might mean, but you say, well, but they'll shoot you. And I'm saying, without wanting to be too graphic, it's far better than the other options, which I will not fill your head with here, but if you have an imagination, I'm sure you can picture what that might be. There's a particular, particularly nasty um, 
case that they, that they, I don't know if they still do it, but new FBI agents, they'd make them listen to an audio that was, that was kept of something that happened to somebody who did get in somebody else's van. It's really unpleasant. It's really, really not good. You're far better off saying no and fighting and dealing with the consequences now. You may be killed. Under those circumstances, somebody puts a gun in your face or a knife to you, you may be killed. But you are better off statistically than going to a secondary crime location and hoping for the best. You're better off statistically when they say, here's some restraints, you must fight. Because if you don't, you're going to die an unpleasant death. And also, if you have uh, people you care around with you, it's not good. It's really, really not good. So in proportion to the threat, every instinct inside of you will be do as you're told. But what I'm telling you is don't. Your instincts will kick in and you'll have a primary emotional response. And I think we're seeing that now. Everybody knows that this situation is really, really now not good. It's really not good. There are um, major changes that have already happened. Like they're not in progress, they've already gone. The whole economic system that was, is gone. And people go, oh, you're worried about economy instead of lives. Economy is lives. Don't fall for the false dichotomy of choosing between lives and economy. It's lives versus lives. The only difference is the timeline. There's an argument that this timeline might be slightly longer, but not much. The kickback of people dying and suffering will be soon. It won't be in five years time. It will be in, it's happening now. It's already begun. It's already happening. We're under pressure. Generally speaking, it is not good to do as you're told when you're pressured into doing it. Why are we under such pressure? Why is it all so shocking? Why is it all so evocative of an emotional response? If there is a real legitimate threat, let's talk in a sober, calm way about the data. Why can't we talk about the data? Why is that not allowed? What is actually happening is people are being wound up and they're going into a strong emotional response of fawning. It's called a fawn response in, in psychology. And when they see other people not fawning, they get very, very upset and angry because they've drawn a line in their head between your refusal to obey and the deaths of other people, which is palpable <coughs> nonsense. Nonsense at this point. If you're looking at data and using your brain and being objective rather than your emotions and consuming massive amounts of brainwashing propaganda. I'm not telling you how to live, but we seem to be hitting a point where we're splitting down the middle. My recommendation, don't be an idiot. Don't say no for no reason whatsoever. Don't cause uh, disruption just for the sake of it. But for God's sake, don't just go along with everything. The longer we wait, the worse it is. The longer we let this continue, the worse it is. And we must be asking one question and let's see if we can. Let's see what happens in the comments. Can we answer one question? Does the threat merit the response or not? That's the only question, ladies and gentlemen. Does the threat merit the response? The secondary question might be, is the response worse than the threat? When people are getting hysterical and saying, just do as you're told, just do as you're told. And you're like, wow, what, where's this coming from? These are the people who in the scenario where the robbers come to the bank or the terrorists break into the plane and everybody's saying, put your restraints on so it's easier for us to execute you. In their heads, they're thinking, if we do as we're told, we'll live. And if you say no, you'll die and we don't want that and everybody else will die. That may seem real, but it is false. Let's start using our brains. Let's reopen the conversation. Conversation starter number one, does the threat, does the data about the threat 
merit the action that we are being bullied into taking. Nobody's asking. We're being forced under the threat of social shaming, under the threat of name calling, under the threat of being arrested just for asking the question, is this necessary? And also, does it even help? Is what we're doing even helping? Because if it's not, why are we doing it? Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you can stay rational and respectful in the comments and uh, that you take this point in the spirit in which it was intended. I very much look forward to having a polite debate with you again very soon. Cheers.